<laughs> we're going to talk about fuel systems momentarily. Um, you know, talking about Fesdo just a couple days ago, the last three accidents in the Lubbock Fesdo were caused by people running out of gas. I don't understand, okay? We have to have 30 minutes reserve or 45 minutes reserve at night. Those are the minimums, okay? Nothing says that you can't land with an hour left and make that your personal minimums. So understanding, keep plenty of fuel in your airplane, okay? Uh, some of the things we talk about, uh, on a highway airplane, we have gravity. Okay, so if I had a high wing airplane, I don't have one to show you, but the gravity feeds down. Uh, we'll typically have a left tank and a right tank, and, and they quite often, generally there's a crossover, but both of them come down and they feed and it goes to the carburetor. Okay, so once you understand that uh, the high wing gravity always works. Now the question I asked yesterday, was if your right tank, you've been flying along for an hour or so in this airplane and you have it on both, the right tank is still showing full and the left tank is going down, what's going on? Okay, maybe the cap came off, okay, and so my fuel is siphoning out of that left tank. If that's what's happening, well guess what? It's going to suck this over there to it too, most likely. Okay, so it may all go out. Uh, or maybe I've got a fuel, my, my gauge over here has failed and it's showing full and it's not, you know, it's still draining, but the gas the, that would, could be there. Or this line has just, a, you know, some kind of a blockage. Okay, I like to tell the story about my blockage where, and these, these lines are very small. Okay, they're smaller than my straw. So, uh, that line, uh, just a teaspoonful of water accidentally gets down that line and freezes. Now I've got a blockage and there's nothing I can do about it. Okay, so now I'm limited to the fuel in that tank. If I'm, if I see an anomaly with my fuel tanks, land, get on the ground, figure it out. Okay, it's as simple as that. Don't, don't make a bad decision because you're trying to diagnose something and you don't, you know, there's no way to diagnose this in flight. Okay, so understanding um, the high wing system. If I have a low wing airplane, gravity is not my friend. Unless I go inverted. No, <laughs> a whole different thing. No, but understanding, so I'm either going to be on my left tank or on my right tank. Thou shalt set the timer. Okay. I don't care what that timer looks like, but you better be paying attention. How much time off the left tank, how much time off the right, get them balanced. Uh, one little trick, if I know I'm gonna have a pretty heavy duty crosswind, I can feed off of that, uh, that right tank so that it's easier to get that left wing down in that crosswind. Heaven help me if I miscalculate, now I'm trying to, <laughs> I've got it. I, I, I'm, I fed down the wrong tank, now I'm like, oh, no, that was bad. I need to go find a different runway now. So, but it is something that I can think about. But, but basically, I want to try to keep them balanced. Okay, so the left and right, typically what happens, people get distracted, and they're feeding on the left, especially if they learn to fly in a Cessna, and they switch to a Cherokee, so now you're used to not having to manage the fuel. It manages itself. I got four hours fuel, boom. I'm on the ground in two hours typically, so I don't have to do anything to worry about. Cherokee, I got two and a half hours on a side on a good day, assuming I left with full tanks. I had one gentleman on a check ride. I let it go. The fuel tank on the right side were actually, you know, actually the fuel, the, the gauges were very accurate in that airplane. Two hours and 20 minutes and he hasn't moved the fuel selector. Yeah, I was getting a little flight. Once the examiner has to tell you to move the fuel selector, you're done for the day, sorry. Okay, it's, it's, it's over. Uh, that being said, with this left and right, okay, um, when I'm flying along in a Cherokee, Mary's a little bit paranoid, so if I'm flying along, uh, I'm, it's time to move to the other tank. I'm gonna scan out here and look, do I have a suitable landing spot? If there's an airport five more miles or five more minutes away, 
maybe I'll just wait until I'm there before I move that fuel selector. I've only had one engine failure when I moved the fuel selector. I got the engine back, but nevertheless, it certainly decreased my range. And so that being said, I'm a, you know, I like to think it's like, okay, one time I learned that lesson, so I'm sharing that lesson with you. Just scan and make sure there's some place suitable for an emergency landing before you move the fuel selector. Okay, uh, the next part of this system is, if I have an electrical failure, okay, in this Cherokee, this isn't a Cherokee, but in a Cherokee or other low-wing airplane, typically when I move the fuel selector, I'm also supposed to turn on the boost pump. Okay, so if I get a vapor lock, if I have anything in there momentarily that causes disruption of fuel to the engine, that boost pump will continue sending fuel to the engine. Uh, but an electrical failure, my boost pump isn't working. So when I move that fuel selector, if I have a little hiccup and the engine quits, I'm done. Okay, so if I have an electrical failure, I'm like, I'm gonna be real thoughtful about moving that fuel selector. Because if that engine quits, there's no way to get it back. We're done, okay? So if I have electrical failure, I definitely wanna be over that airport. Or if I'm landing, maybe I just go ahead and leave it there and not worry about moving that fuel selector. Okay, landing under power is a far better option. Okay, oh, but if I'm, you know, if I'm out of options, Okay, okay, I got me a road down there, I've got a field, it's a muddy day out here, so I'm gonna choose the paved road, no cars, uh, but you know, but, um, but I can move that fuel selector making that decision. And most of the time it's gonna keep on working. I mean, if you fly a low wing airplane, I'm sure at one point in time you have moved that fuel selector without turning on the boost pump. Okay, and, it, and everything was fine. Um, and it will be until it's not. <laughs> and, and then you're not gonna have any warning. So understanding how your fuel system works, okay, and then we're not gonna talk about the carburetors here, we just wanna understand the basics of how your fuel system really functions, the left and the right, the off and the both, uh, whatever kind of airplane you have, make sure you know what's, what's happening when you move that fuel selector. And, uh, you know, with highway airplane, Quite often we can choose left or right or both. Okay, my Cessna 150 is always either off or on. Okay, my 172, I leave it on both, but I can go to left or right. So knowing your knowing your airplane is important. Okay, uh, uh, question? Sometimes they say, like at the, the end of the day, to switch it to right and left. Why, why did they say that on the checklist? I don't understand. Um, Maybe to make sure it'll feed off just one. Oh, okay. Okay, right. would be the reason. Yeah. Or, you know, checklist kind of making sure that, you know, it's kind of like, all right, if you switch it to right, then I'm testing the next person on their pre-flight, did they put it on both? Did they read their checklist? <laughs> right. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why you would do yeah. that. Yeah. I just leave mine on both. Uh-huh. Um, why not? Why not? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we can argue about, do we want to fill the tanks up or do we want to leave an air gap? Okay, um, if I'm carrying a heavy load and I know I need to reduce fuel so I can carry the weight, obviously I'm not going to fill the airplane up because I don't want to defuel. Yeah. Okay, it's humid out there. I really want to keep no air gap in there because I don't want the air in that tank to condense and cause water in my lines. Yes, I can sump it. Uh, but I may not get every single drop out of there. I'll minimize it. If it's pouring down rain, I don't like to get out and gas my airplane in the rain. Okay, that's just me being wimpy. However, uh, I, you know, if I take that gas cap off, guess where that rain is going? Right in. So right on in there. So I don't want water in my tank. You know, it's hard to find a guy that'll hold the umbrella over the gas tank <laughs> as I gas it up. Yeah. <laughs> like, but it's better to have it over the tank than over me. Okay, just be flat honest. Uh, I'll dry off. It's going to be harder to get that water out of the tank. And so water in the tank is a big issue. We need to think about that. If you live in an area with high humidity, you probably don't want to leave that air gap as a rule. Okay, um, another question. Yes, is there a worry if your fuel vent gets blocked? Yes, okay. 
And so what happens if the uh, fuel event, I'm gonna, teaching aid here. Okay. Um, I don't know this is, we're gonna find out. Okay, so what's gonna happen is if my fuel event's gonna get, then if it's a bladder, it will start to compress that bladder. Okay, so uh, if this is all you can see of this bottle, it looks like it's full. Mm -hmm. So if it has a bladder inside there, that bladder, uh, basically what happens if there's no air to equalize the pressure in there, it's going to suck that bladder down flat. And when that happens, the indicator is going to think the, yeah, the tank is still full when obviously it's not. Okay. If, you, if you ever had that happen, you're kind of like, oh, now I understand. Or what will happen is if, uh, if, that, if, it, if that vent is blocked, then, then it doesn't want, there's not enough pressure, and so the, the so it won't feed properly. So, you know, so you'll get a reduced flow of, of fuel down through that little bitty fuel line. Mm -hmm. right. And so we want to make sure that vent is you know, and another little tricky thing on some of these vents on these airplanes is the vent is there also, if I fill my airplane up and then it heats up, the, the gas is going to expand. Oh, right. So the gas, the gasoline expands and it'll come out the vent because it's got to go somewhere. And so it comes out the vent and now it creates this siphoning system. So once it starts flowing out the vent, it just keeps on going. And you can lose five gallons out of that vent line because it kind of created this siphon. Kind of wicks it. Uh, yes. Yeah. And wow. So uh, you know, it's, it's kind of you know, and there are you know, I mean, yes. Um, you talk to these fuel guys, and the position of that vent line, whether it you know, they're it's supposed to be at a certain angle, and you know, I mean, well, it goes like this, yeah. but. If that vent line is angled in the wrong place, um, then then it can affect uh, your fuel flows and all kinds you of could little create a jet and start sucking instead of allowing air in. Yes. Okay. And but it can you know like say oh uh, that pressure I mean they make one tank feed faster than the other. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of little quirks that can set up if that if that vent line is not properly calibrated. Typically nothing super, super critical, but it's little minor things that kind of make a bad day worse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, but you need to know your system and know what's gonna happen if we have a electrical failure. I lose the boost pump, I lose my gauges, and so it's important for me to know the time.